Well, hello and welcome to this Monday edition of Gospel Points. Today, with us, uh, joining us via the phone, is Pastor Joel Tetro. He is the pastor of, excuse me, the Southeast Valley Baptist Church in Gilbert, Arizona. Is also the author of this new book, The Pyramid in the Box, The Decision-Making Process in a Local New Testament Church. Pastor Tetra, welcome to our podcast. Well, thank you, Kevin. It's uh, great to be with you and your audience today. Well, um, let's just jump right into it. This is a book that's about decision-making here in the local church. Now, you're a pastor, but not only are you just leading a local congregation, I, I think you're in a position where you are influencing other pastors and past future pastors. Um, when it comes to the area of pastoral ministry and church work, there is so many things that we could talk about. What is it that drew you to say, I want to write a book about this topic of decision making. I want to research this out more and just kind of get into this a little more in depth and, and pass this along to uh, the, the countless others who will be reading this book. Um, Kevin, that's a great question. I, um, to be very clear, I, <laughs> I don't know that I would have uh, had the foresight or you know the ability to come up with this topic unless the Lord had not done some specific things. I, when I was about uh, 26, 27 years of age, I found myself. I'd already uh, had. I'd already had one ministry behind me. I uh, had served as an associate pastor in a Baptist church in Michigan. It was a great church, great experience. And that was during my seminary years. And um, frankly, having grown up in kind of uh, conservative Baptist and Bible church circles um, and having gone through seminary and actually having served an associate pastor at the age of 26 or 27, I found myself in central Minnesota. Um, I was... Um, pastoring Mildred Bible Chapel. Uh, Mildred Chapel had been established as a, back in 1911. Actually, it was established as a Sunday school back in 1903. And uh, then I think in 19, or 1911, it was reorganized as a church. And uh, very frankly, I was like the third pastor in 70 years. <laughs> the guy before me, the guy before me, uh, uh, Jack Smith, uh, he's the brother of Bob Smith out of Nank. Um, Jack had pastored that church for 35 years, and um, uh, they had a pastor before Jack that had been there for 35 years. So here I am. I'm 26, 27, and uh, uh, pastor of Mildred Bible Chapel, the third pastor in 70 years. And um, I felt the weight of that. And frankly, coming into coming into the senior pastor at, or the lead pastor at role. Um, in those days, I was really struggling, and um, the reason why I was struggling was um, for many years, having grown up in ministry circles, my dad uh, had served as president of International Baptist College in Arizona. He had been in Christian education uh, for years, so I, frankly, I was brought up, in, you know, in and around ministry. And so, frankly, now I was a senior pastor, I'd served as an associate pastor, I was quite uh, personally befuddled. I, I remember Ed Glenny, uh, Ed Glenny was in charge of the postgrad department of Central Seminary. I was uh, brand new in the doctoral program, and Ed said, Joel, do you know what you want to do your terminal thesis project on? I said, yeah, I want to talk about decision making, and the reason why at 26 or 27 I wanted to do some research on that was because, frankly, um, I was personally confused. I, I was very uncomfortable. You know, as I looked around the kind of churches that I had grown up in and the kind of ministries I'd been exposed to, and, man, I saw a lot of, you know, just devastating things in the area of ministry decision-making. And I, and in the book, in the introduction in the first chapter, I talk about the three extremes that, um, I had been faced with early on, and, uh, the, you know, the first extreme I kind of call, it, it, the first extreme is what's often referred, referred to as, uh, you know, the pastoral dictatorship. In some churches, it may not be the pastor, it might be uh, the chairman of a deacon board, you know, or the head of, you know, the head of the executive committee, but in the first extreme, you got one guy, and he pretty much calls all the shots, 
or he pretty much calls, you know, most of the majority of the shots, or certainly, you know, the most important of the decisions, you know, have to be signed off. It goes on his desk. And so uh, kind of a classic, you know, uh, one-man dictatorship. I, Over the years, I've called that the monarchy. Um, the second extreme I saw was a lot of churches that endure that. When that guy was done or, when, you know, they shot him or <laughs> whenever the Lord moved that guy on, a lot of times churches will look at themselves and the the leaders left over kind of holding the bag say, well, we're, we're never, we're never going to let that happen again. And so in some cases you'll go from one extreme, you know, like where a pastor has all authority to a different extreme where the pastor has no authority. And you end up with, you know, in some cases a board run or a deacon run, um, you know, ministry where the senior shepherd has no authority outside of just preaching and teaching. So I call that second extreme, I call that the oligarchy. So we got the monarchy, the oligarchy. And then the third extreme, we, we don't have a lot of it out here in the Southwest, but uh, in the Midwest, man, it was common as corn, and that was conservative uh, Baptist or Baptistic churches where, frankly, no decision would be made until the monthly congregational meeting and they would argue over anything and everything. And it, it, in those churches, it's kind of a pure democracy, right? And uh, uh, the pastors and deacons have, like, no authority. So I call those three extremes uh, the monarchy, oligarchy, and that last one I call anarchy. And so when I was in my doctoral program, I'm, you know, 26, 27, brand-new pastor of Mildred Chapel, and I'm wrapping my head around this, and I was just very befuddled because I knew what I believed was wrong in decision making. I knew, I knew that I was very uncomfortable and I knew that I really felt the scriptures were pretty clear about the problems of those three extremes, um, in dealing with the question of decision making in the church. So I knew what I didn't believe, but I was not, so then it begged the question, well what is the right approach, right? I mean what is the right approach to decision making? So, to answer, I'm, I'm, you know, answering your question here a little bit lengthier than what I wanted to, but so back in my first senior pastor, this was uh, back in 1996, 1997, as I'm wrestling through this question, I'm think, you know, I'm in my doctrinal program considering what my final thesis project would be. It just seemed like a real, uh, just a good fit for me to, to, for me to actually do some research. What is the Bible? Okay, so the Bible doesn't say numbers of things in polity in decision-making, but does it say anything? And so uh, it was really, uh, I never really intended for this to be a book. Frankly, as I just started out, uh, you know, those many years ago, it was just kind of on a personal quest to find out, you know, what does Joel believe about a healthy approach to decision-making in the local church? You know, I, I think that's something that every pastor struggles with to a degree and, and even a lot of churches will, will sit down and figure try to figure out how do we do this uh, and i see that situation right. you kind of mentioned where you know you've, you've got a guy that's been there since you know forever he leaves and all of a sudden the church has to figure out well what exactly do we do um this yeah. guy's just done it the whole, he's done it this way and uh that's the way we've done it but now we're on our own so we don't know what we do and how do i look for the next guy who's going to come in and but Anyway, well, we've just got a few a few minutes left on on this particular program, and we're going to continue this on through some multiple programs here. But probably the most basic question of, about the book is the title, the Pyramid in the Box. Explain that illustration. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I, I, let me just, if you would, let me just one just a quick anecdote, if you will, on just oh, what absolutely. you just said. Yeah, I mean, going back to that scenario uh, where, the you know, you've had a faithful pastor, right, for 25, 30, 35 years. In one sense, the decision-making apparatus or approach to decisions, and a lot of times when you have a faithful guy like that uh, who's been faithfully leading his congregation, man, he's earned trust. And so in one sense, the decision-making kind of revolves around, it, it over time it grows, and and a lot of times when a guy leaves, the church is left looking at each other, and they don't even know themselves what their own approach is to decision-making. So one of the hopes for this book 
is not that people would adopt Joel's view of, you know, you know, what is the right specific approach to decision making. Frankly, I don't care if you agree or disagree with how, you know, we do it at Southeast Valley. One of my biggest motivations is for each, you know, for leaders in ministries to ask themselves, well, what does the Bible say about this? And then come up with, you know, what you believe is the right approach. And so that's, that's what I'm saying. Let me, let me answer that last question that, and I appreciate that. Yeah, the pyramid in the box. Um, so when I, when I speak of, I'm using uh, the pyramid in the box, and I don't like allegory, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit of an allegory. And, um, and when I talk about a pyramid, I'm talking about those in ministry structures, church structures, leaders in those kinds of structures that kind of, they, they frankly look at themselves as standing on top of their own, on their own pyramid. I mean, they, they got their ministry, they got their church, and just like an Egyptian pharaoh standing on top of his pyramid, then this leader is standing on top of his pyramid. And, uh, so that's the idea of pyramid. The idea of box, um, is those ministries who, frankly, the priority of their ministry is the physical, tangible resources of the ministry. That is to say, uh, you know, if we were to ask the question, what drives them in the area of decision-making? Well, frankly, in ministries that have the box mentality, what is most important is that we protect the bank account, we protect the buildings, we pr- we protect the buses, we protect the quote-unquote ministry machinery. And if that means we have to chew through families, if that means we if we use and abuse families, well, so be it. I mean, the ministry must go on. Um, and so, yeah, so the pyramid of the box, uh, uh, both of them reflective of, I think, uh, which at the foundation, I think, uh, causes a domino effect, which leads to further and further unhealthy decision making. Well, Pastor Joel, I want to say thanks for for joining us here in our uh, at least this edition of uh, we're, we're wrapping up to an end. I, I do want to now all of a sudden get into a, com- uh, a conversation about dispensationalists and the use of allegory, but I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off on that. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I, th- I threw you that softball. <laughs> sorry, about that. but. Uh, Thanks for joining us here today, and I want to thank you all for listening. Join us back on Wednesday. We're going to continue this conversation. Again, the book is entitled The Pyramid and the Box, and you can you can purchase your own copy. We'll have the link to it on our website, but uh, you can go to whippenstock.com. Even on Amazon, uh, you, you can purchase this book, and we'd encourage you to do that. So we'll join you here next week, or not next week, excuse me, this, uh, this upcoming Wednesday, and we'll continue our conversation about The Pyramid and the Box.